It's a little after 2 p.m. Rice Village is in the middle of the lunch rush. Suddenly, a deafening boom echoes out. Moments later, a young woman staggers inside a restaurant saying she was just shot in the parking garage next door. She was bleeding and asked for help. They immediately called for an ambulance and the police. Minutes later, first responders arrived and rushed the victim, 30-year-old Julie Graves, to the hospital while police swarmed the area. Found the bullet on the floor of the parking garage near the right rear tire of her vehicle. It was a 38 full metal jacket bullet. It was almost point blank. And it went through my arm here, and it exited here, and it went in here, out, in, and it exited here. And so it literally just went all the way through my body without hitting any vital organs. Let me gather myself for a second. Just 17 days after Julie Graves was shot in Rice Village, Houston police respond to another shooting at a gas station car wash 12 blocks away. Only this time, the victim, 65-year-old Helen Orman, doesn't survive. This lady is vacuuming her car. And according to witnesses, a guy approached her, didn't speak to her, leaned over, shot her one time in the head. No provocation, no reason. He didn't steal a purse didn't try to get the car, didn't do anything. So that, that is a very serious, concerning matter. He was just there to shoot somebody. They described him as a, a medium height, uh, dark skin, tanned, uh, white male. They described the suspect walking away from the murder and getting into a brown Dodge Durango and driving calmly out of the parking lot. Unfortunately, none of the witnesses got a license plate number on the vehicle. It was just like Julie Grace. She was out there minding her own business. It wasn't like any kind of an altercation or anything that was said that could have in any way incensed this person to even make a comment, much less murder her. The Helen Orman shooting let us know that this perpetrator just wanted to kill women. There was no reason, there was no robbery, no sexual assault, nothing to be gained, but he just walked up and he wanted to kill a woman. A lot of times when people are in a traumatic situation where a gun's being pointed at them, all they really remember is the gun. They don't even realize sometimes that they do get a good look at the suspect. So I contacted Lois Gibson, who is the Houston police sketch artist, and asked her to get with Julie Graves to do a composite drawing so that we could at least have something. Within hours, the face of Julie's attacker is released to the media, along with a wanted poster. It doesn't take long for Rice Village residents and business owners to plaster the area with the gunman's image. In most business districts, when something like this happens, they try and push it away as soon as possible because it does hurt business. But we wanted to go the opposite route. We were not going to let this go by without catching the guy. Then on March 23rd, a Rice Village mother drives a couple miles away to a sporting goods store, thinking she'll be safer if she shops outside the area. She has a copy of the sketch of the killer on her passenger seat just in case. As she leaves the store, it's as if the sketch has come alive. She meets a guy that in her mind was a dead ringer to the Julie Graves composite. And she walks in the direction he came from, and she found a vehicle matching the description that was in the newspaper. She did not have anything to write down the license plate number, but her child had a crayon and so she actually wrote the license plate number down with a crayon from her child. The woman immediately calls 911 and police race to the scene, but the Durango is no longer there. 
We spent hours out looking for the vehicle, even during the weekend and driving everywhere we could think of in there. Still no luck trying to find the Dodge Durango. Then, on April 4th, 250 miles away from Houston, veteran Texas State Trooper Coy Morales unknowingly joins the investigation. While I'm sitting there having supper, something, something inside my head says, go to work today. It wasn't my day to work, but uh, something just told me to come to work, so that's what I did. I did my uh, patrol procedures and uh, up through Interstate 10. I didn't notice anything suspicious uh, at all. Uh, it was pretty much the norm for that particular area. I did notice that a few vehicles were in the unlit portion of the rest area. People don't want to be noticed uh, if they're running from the law, so they'll find a place to park this a little bit darker. I stay in my patrol car and I run the license plates one by one. Five minutes later, I get an alert tone out of one of those. It says stolen license plate out of Fort Bend County, but I also get a second alert tone. Vehicle wanted in a homicide. Occupants are considered armed and dangerous. Trooper Morales immediately calls for backup. Within minutes, three cops quietly arrive. Sirens silenced. Patrol headlights off. AR-15s in hand. I took the lead. We slowly walked up to the vehicle, which was approximately 100 foot away. Since I didn't know if there was anybody in there, I walked up shotgun in hand and flashlight in the other hand. Sure enough, there's an individual in there and he's sleeping. The adrenaline is definitely up there, heart's pounding, and I've got a murder suspect. I knocked on the door and commanded him, you need to step out of the truck, police. He grabbed the steering wheel, looked out the door. His eyes were huge, and then he tried to start the truck. I opened that door and then grabbed him with both hands. And then this time, uh, one of the officers assisted me with, with getting pulling him out of there. Once we got him handcuffed, I walked back to the vehicle. The door was still open. And in the center console, there was a cup holder. I noticed there was a uh, revolver there. The gun is a 38 caliber pistol same kind of weapon used to shoot Julie Graves and kill Helen Orman. He resembled the Julie Graves sketch. He was probably 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, he was not a bodybuilder, but he was muscular. He had no identification on him, and he would not cooperate with uh, the police out there. He wouldn't tell anybody who he was. So they identified him by fingerprinting him. Uh, once they identify him, they get a uh, driver's license. It's the same guy. They know who it is. The suspect is 34-year-old Bo John Maloney, and his prints are on file because he's a career criminal with a string of arrests for violent behavior. He moved in with his mother for a while, and he was very violent toward her and injured her very seriously. During one attack, he headbutted a Houston cop at his mother's apartment complex who tried to intervene. That landed him in prison for a year and made him mad. When he got out, he had nothing but a new prison record and a Texas-sized vendetta. Fueled by anger, he headed right over to his mother's Houston neighborhood, Rice Village. The fact that a uh... Bo John Maloney's mother lived in Rice Village, and so we knew he had stayed in that area. Then it made a lot more sense. It was like you can finally 
take a deep breath. Like I felt like for over a year I'd been holding my breath. And then now I know that he is, I'm finally safe. As the DA readies for trial, he makes a controversial decision. To make sure Maloney doesn't walk, he puts Helen's case on ice and focuses on the attempted murder of Julie Graves. The penalty for aggravated robbery, deadly weapon, and for the murder is the same, life in prison. The case that we had on Julie Graves shooting was much better than on the murder. We have the actual live complainant that identifies him, and then the witnesses all identified him. The gamble pays off. On July 22, 2005, Bo John Maloney is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. He was truly, truly an evil person that had no signs of remorse for anything he did or showed any sign of having a conscience about what he would do. Bo John Maloney has got no business breathing free air among the public forever. He's right where he belongs. <laughs>